Howdy, it's Tubal Kane, also known as Mr. Pete 222, inviting you to join me in yet another steam engine build. Now, this is the one that I built in a recent video series of uh, eight parts. It's a little spool valve type engine made with no castings. Now, in this video, I'm going to make this engine, and it is made from a casting. It's something you will not be able to, to make because it requires a casting, unless, of course, you would take a billet and machine it out or adapt this. But this uh, engine is really very, very similar to the other engine in the way it operates with the spool valve. It uses the same flywheel and some of the same parts, but it's just in a horizontal configuration rather than vertical and made from castings. This one also features a little reversing valve, which I'll show you here momentarily as a bonus feature. So let me run this for you real quick and then uh, we'll get started on the build. Here it is running on four or five pounds of air pressure and later on uh, I will run it on steam, at least the finished one I will run on uh, live steam as I did on that other video. This video will consist of many parts. I'm not sure how many yet. Uh, time will tell. And even if you do not build steam engines or, uh, or models, you may enjoy this video uh, just to see the different uh, machining operations uh, that I perform and they can be adapted and applied to other areas as well. And I mentioned this earlier that are, there are many of you that maybe uh, live in southern Florida or or in a retirement community or in a high-rise or whatnot that do not have any kind of machinery or tools but still enjoy this or did this kind of work before you retired. I'm a retired man myself at 71 years of age and enjoy doing this. So looking at this, this is the first time that I have built an engine of this type with a reversing valve. So if I simply stop it and uh, spin it in the other direction It'll, uh, it'll work either way, and that's done with a little uh, uh, slotted uh, device down on the uh, eccentric, which I'll explain later on. I think I will. That'll be one of the very last things we do near the, the end. Now, when I do a build like this, this often takes me uh, a full week or more with the filming and all of that that I do. Uh, I probably could build this in two days without interruption or without uh, taping, but it takes a little longer to make the setups and so on. So I hope you enjoy this. So I'll tell you now how I got started with this and in my planning stages and the uh, patterns that I had to make and the castings. So here we go. I've mentioned numerous times that I do not make drawings, but this was an exception here, and I did not make working drawings. I just made sketches, actually with the T-square and all of that. I do not do CAD, but uh, so that I could see how the parts would fit together, and this is uh, time well spent and, and semi-enjoyable also, because otherwise, uh, as I progress into a build, if I've never done one before, I run into problems. Uh, interferences and so on. So I did make uh, several sketches here and then I uh, the second one that I did is uh, both a top and a front view and I think you can see a faint outline here of the flywheel and at this point the flywheel was still interfering with the base and I was thinking about making a well for that or hanging the uh, flywheel outboard but changed my mind but you can see here how I got uh, the alignment of the of the cylinder and the valve body and uh, along with the base and so on in this overhead view and then finally and you can see I'm using all different kinds of paper I don't know why I did that because this is already a year ago and this is pretty much the, the finished idea here without any dimensions and in fact what I do then is to scale things right off of the the drawing here. I know that's a no-no for you engineers, but I actually scale some of the things that I do. And when I design this, I start with uh, the flywheel that I have available, and that's a two and a half inch flywheel. So I uh, pretty much drew the flywheel and then drew everything else around the two and a half inch flywheel. 
And I've talked enough about this type of flywheel where I'm not going to dwell on it because that's mentioned in my other drawings as well. But you can see here again uh, where the valve is and the main cylinder. But I have not shown any of the hidden lines in here. And as far as the bore is concerned, this is a 5 8 bore with, a, I believe, a 3 quarter stroke. I'll measure that again. But I'm going to reduce the size of the bore to half or 9 sixteenths. And as I've told you in uh, other uh, engines that I've, that I've uh, developed, that it doesn't seem to matter much what the bore is or the stroke. They all run and run quite well because we're not trying to develop any real power here. So that's enough of the drawing. Let me show you the next step. I failed to show you this in the previous video when I'm making uh, this particular engine. That I started, uh, also I think I made some sketches, that's quite a while ago. But then I simply took a piece of uh, basswood, or you can take a uh, 2x4 or whatever, and using the bandsaw, I rough cut this, and I do mean rough, to the exact size, just to see how things are going to work. Matter of fact, this was number two, so I think I did a total of three of these until I got the dimensions that I wanted, so I must have made uh, some other changes. I didn't cut myself, that's just layout die. So that's how I developed this one. And that also was developed around the one inch by two inch aluminum stock that I had uh, uh, quite a large supply of. Similarly, when I made uh, this one, this is just made up with, uh, again, uh, basswood or aspen, whatever I got that's soft and easy to work with that is the right thickness. And I like to buy some of that hobby wood in various thicknesses when I do something like this. And there it is, cut out. It's been glued together in spots. You can see that. And I even put a hole in there for the flywheel. And uh, I must have made more than one of these and throw them away, but you can see here's another one where the, the flywheel is going to interfere with the base. So I changed the height of that slightly. And I usually do that over a several day period as I'm thinking about it and uh, uh, doing other projects as well. But this gives me something to put in my hands while I'm watching uh, TV or watching the news and, uh, and contemplate it. Well, after doing that, then I made the actual foundry pattern. Now, this is the pattern itself. And I really made this quickly because I didn't think that I would be making more than one or two castings. And in fact, at this point, I've made three castings, just three castings. And I, I may never make any more. So I do not like to put a lot of time into a, a foundry pattern because they are very time consuming if I'm not going to make a lot of them. Well, I don't sell them, so I don't need a lot. But uh, let's take a look at how this is made. This has some removable parts, which I do not typically do because I needed the parting plane, if you know what that is. So all these parts came apart and this is a flat back pattern at this point. Much thicker than I would like right here. And when you have a real thick part in your casting, there's a tendency for it to shrink and have a shrink hole. It's just the way, uh, way it is in the foundry when the metal solidifies. So that's a problem. I would love to have cored that hole so that I would uh, reduce the thickness. But since the parting plane, the parting line is down here, there is no practical way to uh, make core prints and to core that. So it's just a solid casting without cores. But if I make a core, then it requires a core box as well. But in the, uh, the mold, in the flask, I ram this up in the sand, and you've seen me do that many times, and then after it's buried in the sand up to the parting line, then I reassemble this, and uh, here's the rest of the base I would put in there. And this is something I don't typically do, and that's to put the fillet on a removable piece. I've never done that before, but you really need a fillet there so you don't have the shrinkage. And then the little boss here for the bearing, that's actually the main bearing, that can be put on. Notice everything's tapered. And finally, the valve body. And you can see I got X's here. 
that hangs over a little bit, it doesn't matter, it's going to be machined. I wish that I would have put a fillet right in here as well, because that was problematic, and down here. And if I ever make any more of these, I'll, I'll add that on, because it only takes a few minutes. I like to use that leather fillet. You can see how it's all tapered. That's called pattern draft. And then from the pattern and the mold I produced a casting. And here it is still with the sprue and the gate on it. And that will be sawed off. And you know I, I ran a, a rather large gate right into the thickest spot so that the shrinkage, the whole idea is that this is a, a riser, combination of riser and sprue and you see the shrinkage here? I want the shrinkage to be up here, not uh, someplace here. And in this configuration also the shrinkage most typically would be someplace here. And in fact you can see right here that there is some shrinkage, but it isn't going to hurt anything. Some of you have asked how come I use only one sprue and I'm not using a riser. On small castings it doesn't seem to matter. But on a bigger casting, you need a sprue to allow the metal to get into the mold, and then a riser to uh, vent it and to uh, allow free flow of metal, and also to aid in the control of the shrinkage that I just talked about. But there's the finished casting. And I had made two of them. There's the other one, and this is the one that I'll actually use today. And you can see right here I had a little fall in of sand. I can machine that out but it really doesn't hurt anything. There's still some sand on there. But if I had a fillet in there I wouldn't have had that problem. Also I really needed a fillet around here because you can see there's a little bit of a fall in right there. But when a fillet is employed look at how nice that turns out on both sides, you see. And that was made, uh, oh, ten months ago, eight months ago or so. And this is the one that I will start machining here presently, and I will start by machining the bottom. So let's step over to the Bridgeport Mill and I'll show you how I'm going to set that up. I know I preach all the time about making sure you have some way to hang on to your uh, castings or your project, but uh, this is one where I didn't give it much thought ahead of time. So this is a most irregular and difficult casting to hold in the vise, and I spent quite a bit of time doing this setup here. But essentially now I've got parallels or, or blocks of steel pushing up against that uh, vertical portion of the casting. And I think I got it pretty well leveled out, at least uh, for as accurate as the casting was, or as accurately as the uh, pattern was, was made. And using my little Shear Tomiko surface gauge, and I don't use a surface gauge very often, but it sure is handy in this case. And this is a nice true surface here on top of the vise, so I have adjusted with this little knob, watch the end here of the, uh, of the surface gauge. I suppose you've all used one of these. I can raise it and lower it, and using uh, my brass hammer to tap the work with the vise only snug, I was able to get it uh, to where all four corners are pretty good. Now this corner, if, if any, is just a little bit high, but for all intents and purposes this is going to be close enough. It has to be close enough, and uh, this uh, Shear Tomiko is a, is a smaller one uh, than what you usually see, so it fits perfectly here. Now another way of doing that, if you don't have a surface gauge, would be to bring the, the uh, cutter down, and without it revolving, just compare the corners. Compare that one, work around, and, and see how far you're off uh, on each corner. You can use a feeler gauge or just a flashlight and uh, your uh, 
uh, your eyes, you can do it pretty accurately. Now when I'm done here machining, there probably will be one corner that's a little thicker than the other. But I want it to basically be level because all of my other machining is going to revolve around that flat surface. But now I'm happy with the way it's clamped and it's tight enough, it's good and sturdy. And uh, notice that I had to hang the cylinder part out because it's a little bit higher and this this uh, vise does not have real deep jaws. If, if I had a vise with real deep jaws it would be so much easier to hold this because I could clamp it by the sides here but I'm not able to do that. This also could probably be held on angle plates and a lot of different ways. Usually it's, it's just up to your own uh, imagination how you're going to hold something that's this irregular. I am ready to mill. I'm ready to cut. Remember that the center part here is the the thickest part because of the pattern draft and all of that. Now be sure and wear your safety glasses and observe all your safety rules when you're working on power machinery. So I'll just take a cut right down the center and see where I'm at. and the bottom will be cleaned up and there's no particular dimension here. I'm just machining until it cleans. And I'm just finishing up with my last pass. I didn't take off very much. But it cleaned up on all four corners. Where's my... Looks pretty good because uh, you do not want to take something out of the vise till you're sure you're done. Because you'll never get it back in the same, especially when it's this irregular. So this is looking good. Uh, the finish couldn't matter less. It's not a great finish. I don't do not care. Remember that will never show. All right, I'm going to take it out. There it is. And if you look here, not that it matters, but uh, all four corners are approximately the same thickness. Now I got a little other cleaning up to do, and I'll do that with a file. Now I'm going to knock this uh, parting line off and clean that up real quickly. That could be done on the belt sander, but this needs to be cleaned up. There's no way to get that on the belt center, so I will just take a file to it. I've laid out two mounting holes, one here, and that's 5 16 in each way. Another one right here, and I'll drill them 11 64 There's really no need for uh, holes on all four corners and uh, this one would be difficult and would have to be drilled from the bottom so I'm just going to use two and some of the dimensions and things that I'm doing are taking off, off of the, uh, the one that I made last year. Also I believe when I'm done I probably will, will make a plinth for this using this uh, this is 3 8 thick aluminum but I'll cut one a little bit larger than the base here all the way around and and put a fancy edge on it, and that will be the, the plinth. Looking at the finished engine from the end view here, I do not like that uh, pattern draft showing like I did on this, so I'm going to square everything off. So in other words, I'll machine it down so that uh, this corner here is at a right angle. And the way I'm going to do that, I've just got some parallels there in the vise, and I'll put the 
project right down in there, tighten it up, tap it down just a little bit. Now, it looks like I might be touching the vise there, but I, I don't believe I am because I'm running a feeler gauge through there. So that's okay, and I'll just machine the top off. The bottom part will have to be done in another setup with the side of an end mill. Even though the project is held rather securely in the vise by the base down here, if you can imagine looking at it from this way that uh, it's really only supported by quarter inch aluminum. So I'm getting quite a vibration. So I had to give up on using uh, this wide cutter. I thought I could just take one pass across it and get a real nice finish, but I had to give up on that and put a smaller end mill in the collet. Then just taking a parallel and clamping it on there, and it's a bit precarious, but I'm taking light cuts, but that is dampening it. Because this is not fastened in any way to the vise or the table. It's just clamped on to the casting, but that is heavy enough to where it has dampened it. And now I can finish up milling the top. Takes care of that. <laughs>